Hello friends, welcome to lecture 4.5 on the course uh, on introduction to time frequency analysis and wavelet transforms. So, in this lecture we are going to talk about the requirements of time frequency analysis techniques. Until now that is in the previous until the previous lecture we have studied the theoretical properties of energy densities in particular we have studied the duration bandwidth principle of course, the definitions of duration and bandwidth as well. So, now it is time to plunge into the techniques themselves especially the short time Fourier transform, the wigner willi distribution and the wavelet transform. But before we plunge into these tools we should ask what do we expect of them? What is typically expected of a time frequency analysis tool that I am going to use and we are going to not list out all the requirements. We, are, uh, we will list out the requirements with respect to specific applications, but these are broad applications namely feature extraction, secondly filtering and denoising and thirdly signal compression. The last two are, are closely related that is the filtering and signal compression, but feature extraction is a totally uh, different set of application. Now, in feature extraction normally we construct joint energy density pretty much like what we did in Fourier analysis when I want to extract the oscillatory features I construct the spectral density and I search for peaks in the spectrum and so on. Likewise here in time frequency analysis when I am looking at feature extraction then I would construct a joint energy density and search for the required features in the joint energy density plot. Now, of course, now uh, once again there are several ways of constructing this joint energy density depending on the tool that you are using, but then to be able to make meaningful analysis from the joint energy density plot we should require that these techniques theoretically satisfy certain properties and what we will learn at the end of the lecture that uh, is that there is no tool out there which will satisfy all the requirements that we stipulate. Regardless of the application that you are looking at that is whether it is feature extraction, filtering and denoising or signal compression or approximation and so on, there are fundamental limitations to what we can do and we have discussed this before, we have seen this before. The first limitation obviously being governed by the duration bandwidth principle which essentially says that I cannot construct a joint density that is very finely localized in both time and frequency. If the joint density is narrow in time it has to be broad in frequency and vice versa. This does not mean that I will not be able to locate the frequency component and so on. This is unfortunately the misinterpretation that it leads to. How you locate a particular frequency how you extract this information depends on further post processing that you do of the joint energy density, but prima facie what is happening is that the joint density is going to be finely localized only in one dimension. Now of course, different techniques will give you different trade offs on the localization and which technique is suited for a particular application depends on the signal characteristics and so on. These, this aspect will become clearer when we discuss the specific techniques. The second limitation is governed by the non-additivity of spectra which we had which I had mentioned uh, in one of the previous lectures. Here I have an illustration for you. I have here on the left top two panels I have two signals which are chirps. One dies down after a while and the second one uh, starts off after a while before being inactive. Now, when I look at the spectra of these two signals I have these uh, spectra they are obviously they have different frequency content. Let us say I add up these two signals and I look at the spectrum of the added signal that is now I have just simply numerically added these two signals. So, the spectrum of the added signal or the spectral density is actually shown here at the bottom. Above this bottom panel on the right hand side I have the sum of spectra of the individual signals. If things were ideal in an ideal world I would expect spectra to add up so that 
when I look at the spectrum of the added signal, there is no difference between the added spectra and the spectrum of the added signal and then that there are no artifacts. Unfortunately, when I add two signals, I have what are known as interferences, right. And let me explain that to you. Why? What is this interference term? Why does it arise? So, let us take a signal that is made up of two signals x 1 and x 2. It could be even in continuous time as well, does not matter. Now, when I take the Fourier transform of each of these signals, discrete time or continuous time, by the linearity property, the Fourier transform of the composite signal is the sum of the respective Fourier transforms of the individual ones. Until here, things are all right, but when I am looking at the spectral density of the composite signal. And when I work out the math for the spectral density, from the theory of complex numbers, I know that when I add two complex numbers, x1 and x2 are complex valued numbers. On the right hand side, I will have the respective squared magnitude plus this term here. The cross term, let us say I have here theta of omega. This theta of omega is the phase between these two uh, signals at that frequency. Unless this theta is 90 degrees, this cross term would not vanish. In other words, if the signals are orthogonal or uncorrelated at that frequency, you will not have the spectrum of the comp spectral density of the composite signal being the sum of the respective spectral density. So, this is the interference term. that causes the appearance of spurious features in the uh, spectral uh, density, spectral plot of uh, the composite signal that you see at the bottom panel on the right hand side. So, the appearance of this interference terms in fact, causes problems in interpretations, because now I have spurious features which are purely artifacts of mathematical operations. They are not necessarily a part of the composite signal at all. And this is going to be the case in all time frequency analysis techniques, because I am going to have typically non stationary signals where the frequencies change with time. And this example is a representative of all those situations. And therefore, you will run into interferences and so on. So, let us look at first the joint density or the joint energy density. The motivation for looking at joint energy density is fairly obvious by now. In time, if I look at the energy density in time, it gives me the intensity of the signal at a time t. And if I am looking at the spectral density, it gives me the time uh, intensity at a particular frequency. And then the respective fractional energies in the interval or in the band can be computed. However, in practice, quite often I would be interested in knowing the intensity of frequency at a given time and that is why I would need the joint energy density. As I mentioned early on, assuming that I am interested in extracting the features, I am constructing the joint energy density. If I am interested in filtering, maybe I do not need to construct a joint energy density at all. I simply work with the transforms, perform certain operations in the transform domain reconstruct and I get the filtered component. I There is no need to look at the joint energy density at all. However, the principles governing the construction of energy densities or filtering or signal compression and so on more or less are the same. That is the limitations governing these are, are more or less the same. So, coming back to the energy density, is it possible to construct an energy density which will give me this information? That is, I would like to know the intensity of a frequency at a given time t. So, I am asking for a very fine localization in time and in frequency domain and obviously, that is not going to be possible given the duration bandwidth principle. 
Okay, that's the basic limitation that just comes into the picture immediately. And so uh, therefore, I have to now step back and say, well, I'm going to restrict myself to an interval of time uh, in time or a band of frequencies. Even there, what are the possibilities? What are the trade-offs involved? And most importantly, what properties should the joint energy density possess? By properties, what we mean is, if there is a certain change in the signal, that should be reflected accordingly in the joint energy density and so on. This will become, uh, become clearer as we move along. The, before we look at the requirements of a joint energy density, what is important to keep in mind is there are at least two different ways of constructing the uh, energy density or even the power densities. One, as a squared magnitude of a transform, we have seen this earlier as well in the uh, Fourier analysis or Fourier domain. We take the Fourier transform and, and then take the squared magnitude that will give me the density. And this is the principle that is followed in constructing the spectrogram and scalogram. The other alternative is uh, by first constructing the autocovariance function and then taking the Fourier transform. In Fourier analysis, that is in pure frequency domain analysis, we would just construct the ordinary autocovariance function and then take the Fourier transform. And this is what we refer to as a wiener kinchin theorem and so on. A similar idea exists in time frequency analysis as well, where we construct what are known as local autocovariance functions. Now the autocovariance function is not going to be simply a function of a single quantity lag. It's going to be a function of two things, lag and the local time. But still I can take a Fourier transform of that and that will give me the local energy density in the time frequency plane. This is the idea that's used in wigner welle distribution. All right. Now, does it matter really how I construct these, uh, these uh, densities? Well, yes, because the properties of the resulting energy density can vary. And one such property is the positivity, this, which is the most important or non-negativity, you may say, because spectral density can be 0. So the appropriate term is non-negativity. Now, the fundamental requirement for any density function to be meaningful is that it should be non-negative value. And this depends on, that is whether this property is satisfied by the joint energy density depends on how you have constructed the energy density. So as we have just discussed, there are two different ways of constructing this. In the first method, I am manually constructing the energy density, which means I take a transform and then take the squared magnitude. What does it mean? It means that I am guaranteeing non-negativity because squared magnitudes of a complex number cannot be negative. Therefore, this property is immediately satisfied by spectrogram and scalogram. On the other hand, there is no guarantee that the direct construction method will give you a non-negative spectral density in the, uh, in the time frequency plane. In the pure frequency plane, the real value and, and positivity is guaranteed by uh, certain properties of the autocovariance function. But in the case of the time frequency analysis, this is not necessarily guaranteed. In fact, the fundamental result proved by Wigner states that the positivity of a bilinear, bilinear means you can say quadratic, that is squared quantities of the transforms or where signals are appearing in multiples or uh, as products. Then there, when you look at a distribution that is constructed in a bilinear manner, there is no way actually you can guarantee positivity and other properties to be satisfied simultaneously. Particularly what Wigner said is, showed is that the positivity of a distribution or a density is very closely related to what is known as the marginality property that we will study next. And this was the fundamental result and it governs all the bilinear or quadratic time frequency distributions. Okay. The consequences of this will become more clear when we study the wigner welle distribution. But let us study the marginality property first. So what does marginality mean? Marginality essentially means that if I sum up the energy density in the time frequency plane along one dimension, I should be able to recover the energy density in the other dimension. This term marginality is also encountered in the uh, in probability theory and theory of random variables and so on. Now just 
uh, a word of uh, caution, although I keep giving you the analogy with the probability theory, it does not mean that it is a prerequisite for understanding this course. I am just giving you this analogy so that if you are familiar with probability theory, you may be able to easily follow these things, but you do not have to have a base in probability theory necessarily to understand any of the techniques that we are talking about. So, going back to the analogy of probability theory, we speak of joint densities in probability theory as well when we are looking at more than one random variable. There we have joint densities and the concept of marginal densities. When I integrate the joint density along one random variable dimension, then I recover the marginal density for another dimension. So, the requirements are stated in equations 2 and 3. If I integrate the energy density along the frequency domain, I should recover the energy density in time and likewise for frequency. At this moment, it may appear strange that, that there could be techniques that do not necessarily satisfy this. Okay, why, should, why should they not satisfy? One quick way of understanding this is, remember techniques such as uh, spectrogram and scalogram or the energy densities uh, resulting from spectrogram and scalogram are coming out of a manual construction. That is, you are actually constructing the energy densities and remember there is a certain windowing that is involved. And both these windowing and the manual construction of the energy density are the ones that can spoil these requirements and they do. In fact, spectrogram and scalogram fail to satisfy the marginality conditions. Let me explain this to you with a simple example here. It is not a complete example, but I will take the support of this example to illustrate the point. <coughs> Excuse me. So, now I have this uh, signal coming from an industrial process, it is coming from a control loop. The, it's the plot on the top is not the signal, it is actually the energy density in time. So, it is a squared signal itself and the, the plot on the left here of the left figure itself is the spectral density. And here the big plot, the two dimensional plot is the energy density in the time frequency plane where the energy is represented by the color. Now, obviously, the spectral density tells me that the signal is oscillatory and of course, uh, and also that there are some other accompanying frequencies, but to a minor extent. The joint energy density here constructed from spectrogram tells me uh, something more than what the spectral density can tell me. It tells me that yes, there are these frequencies present in this signal over these times, but the intensity of this frequency varies with time. So, you can see from the changing colors here that the, the intensity is maximum here in this interval and it is low here. In fact, there is a shift of frequency from this region to the main dominant frequency and then another mild shift in the frequency. So, what is marginality requirement here mean? If I let us say I pick this dominant frequency and I walk a long time, add up all the energy densities that I have from spectrogram, I should be able to recover this peak here. Now, it turns out that it does not and I will show you this in more in detail when we talk about spectrogram. That, that is what marginality requirement means. In fact, the other requirement is I pick a certain time t and I walk along the frequency domain axis all add up all the energy densities, I should be able to recover the value of the energy density at that point in time. That is also not satisfied by spectrogram. Likewise, for the scalogram here as well. On the right hand side, you have the scalogram. I have constructed this using a Morlet wavelet. Both these plots are generated using the time frequency toolbox. The uh, scalogram also fails to satisfy the marginality requirement. And of course, the other thing that you should also notice here is the loss of localization in frequency. Look at how finely the spectral density is localized in frequency, that is the Fourier spectral density. Whereas, uh, whether it is a scalogram or the spectrogram, there is a certain smearing of the energy. There is a spread of energy in the frequency domain. The localization is not as fine as what you see in spectral density. And again, this is a consequence of the duration bandwidth principle. Because I want one foot in time, 
I can only keep one foot in frequency domain and therefore, I have this loss of localization. Remember, I do not use the term resolution. I am constantly using the term localization. Okay. So, hope now that the marginality property requirement is clearer. A weaker requirement is that the area under the energy density should yield the total energy, which is generally satisfied by all these uh, techniques that we are looking at, whether it is spectrogram, scalogram or wigner willi and so on. In fact, I should mention that wigner willi distribution satisfies the marginality property. I did not show you the wigner willi distribution for that example, but that is the beauty of the wigner willi distribution. But the biggest problem with it is it is not, uh, does not guarantee non-negative spectral uh, or the energy spectral energy densities. And that is what essentially Wigner's result says. If they take if a particular energy density satisfies the marginality requirement, it cannot be guaranteed to have non-negative valued uh, energy densities and vice versa. If it satisfies the positivity or non-negativity requirement, then it cannot uh, satisfy the marginality requirement. So, coming back to the total energy requirement, this is a weaker requirement because the if the area under the energy density adds up to the total energy, it does not necessarily mean that the marginality properties are satisfied. So, going back to this figure here, if I add up the energy densities here and taking into account the wind the windowing that I must have done in either in short time Fourier transform or uh, constructing the uh, or the wavelet transform. Once I take into account the windowing effect and I construct the total energy density, still uh, I, I will uh, then I will be able to satisfy this requirement, it will add up to the total energy, but that does not necessarily mean that the marginality property is satisfied. And many densities satisfy the total energy requirement. This is a very important requirement, energy preservation is quite important, otherwise, then you would get absurd uh, results as well. Now, very often in fact, the purpose of time frequency analysis is to find the local properties of the signal in the time frequency plane. That is the most important purpose of time frequency analysis. Otherwise, why would I uh, break my head in evaluating this two dimensional transform? I would simply live with the Fourier transform. Therefore, now it is time to talk about the local properties. What are these local, how are these local properties evaluated in terms of the conditional properties? And specifically, we want to know at a given point in time, what is the energy density in frequency and if I pick a certain frequency, what is the energy density in time. So, I am specifying locally what is, I am asking locally what is happening and to be able to construct this, we construct what are known as the uh, local or the conditional energy densities. So, you can see here, please read S in place of P. So, I have here the local energy density of frequency at a given point in time and this definition is along the same lines as what we have in probability theory once again, where the, the conditional density f of x given y is f of x comma y divided by f of y. That is exactly the expression that I have here. In place of the probability densities, I have the energy densities. Now, Typical, typically, there are no specific requirements on these densities themselves, but these densities are used in computing the conditional quantities such as local averages and local spreads. For example, I would like to know at a given time what is the average frequency, right. If I pick a certain time t, I would like to know what is the average frequency. Let me take you back to the example here at, at a given time t. So, let us pick this time here 100. And I would like to know at this time what is the average frequency or I pick another time here 400, I would like to know what is the average frequency. What is the use of this? This is of great use in fault detection, in feature extraction. I would like to know how the features of the signal are changing. And if I have a certain template in mind for normal operating condition and I compare these features with the template, then I will be able to detect the presence of any anomalies or faults and so on. So, that is the local average of frequency at a given point in time. Likewise, I can pick a frequency. So, I can pick for example, this frequency here and ask what is the average time spent by this frequency, right. 
That is also important because I would like to know how long a frequency component persisted. It is very useful in biomedical signal analysis, uh, process data analysis, all these features are uh, very nice and they can be exploited in a very beneficial manner. That is exactly what we are evaluating here. The average frequency at a given time t and the average time spent by a, a frequency component. If the technique is right, that is if your energy density uh, is good and so on and has been constructed in an appropriate manner, then these expressions should yield what are known as the instantaneous frequencies and group delays that we have seen already. Obviously, because the average frequency at a given time is the instantaneous frequency itself. Of course, instantaneous frequency is actually the frequency at given uh, at a given time t. But if I have a multi component signal that is if I have many frequencies at a given time t, then the average frequency is nothing but the instantaneous frequency itself. If I have a single component at a given time t, it should actually yield the instantaneous frequency itself. They should all match. Likewise, the average time spent by frequency component is what we had defined as group delay before. If you recall the particular lecture, then you should be able to re, uh, verify that the group delay is nothing but the average time spent by certain by that particular frequency component. And again, we expect that the particular method that I am using for time frequency analysis will give me these results correctly. So, what I do is I construct the energy density, evaluate the right hand side, of course, replace the integrals with summations because I would be not I would not be able to compute the energy density over a continuum. So, I compute the right hand side and then I also compute the instantaneous frequency independently and see if they both tally. Okay, that is how I would do it. Of course, the way instantaneous frequencies are computed with joint energy densities are slightly different particularly for spectrogram and scalogram uh, using what are known as ridges and so on. We will talk about it later.